come only Arabic people are sensitive to the smell of meat and eggs on plates? Frida seems to think that there is this smell that is left behind when you eat certain foods and then you don't wash your crockery in a certain way, but that only Middle Eastern people can smell this smell. What the hell are you talking about? Before we even start to answer the question, we're going to find out if it's even a thing. We have recruited eight volunteers. Four of them are of Middle Eastern background and four of them are not. The volunteers will take turns sniffing 10 plates. Five of the plates have had eggs previously placed on them and the other five have not. All 10 have since been washed gently with water and dried. And turns out our Middle Eastern volunteers guessed an average 3.5 out of the five eggy plates correctly. Our non-Middle Eastern volunteers only guessed an average of 0.5 correctly. In other words, Frida's got a point. So I visited her at the kitchen where she works. All right, Frida, you've got my attention. What is this mystery smell? Zanha. 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 Zan? Zan. Ha. 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 So what does Zanha mean? It's hard to explain, but like it would be on plates, like after you make eggs or you deal with chicken. Even sometimes when you cook the chicken or cook meat. If you haven't washed it properly, you get a zanha smell. Yeah. How do I get rid of the smell? Do well, I just wash it? No, if you just wash it with hot water, the smell's still gonna stay. So you gotta rinse it with cold. Right, now, we know that this mystery smell is real and we know there's a word for it in Arabic. But one thing I can't, actually, do you mind doing this bit for me? I've kind of got my mouth full. Sure thing. But what I couldn't understand was why smelling zanka, 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 was particular to one cultural group. I needed to look at this up close. Really close, like molecular close. This is Professor Russell Keast, an expert in food and sensory science at Deakin University. And for some reason, he's agreed to help us isolate the chemical composition of the zanka smell. What were the main aromas that we picked up in the experiment? Well, there, there was actually a lot and, and a lot of diverse aromas. No one was what we would call zanka, but, but if we go through a few, we've got grass, tallow, citrus, rancid, pine, turpentine, almond, burnt sugar, mushroom, lemon, green, orange, plastic, fat, sulfur, earthy, burnt onion, and spice. So there's a lot of components to this smell, but they're not necessarily bad individually. Generally, this is what happens that you've got your compounds which have characteristic aromas to them, like, you know, the mushroom or the almond. When they're mixed together in the right proportions, maybe then that combination creates something that's unpleasant. Is it possible that there is an aroma that only some people can smell? One that comes to mind is a mousy taint um, that, that occurs in wine, but not everyone can get it, and, and it smells like a mouse cage. Oh, that is disgusting, but not as disgusting as what I thought it would be when you said mouse taint. Is there a genetic reason why some people then might be able to smell zanka while other people can't? I wouldn't think so. It's very unlikely that somebody would have a genetic predisposition not to identify all of those compounds. So it's more likely that it is a smell that people learn to pick up on in their upbringing? That's right. Thank you so much, Professor, and may I say with utmost respect, smell you later. Smell you later, Alex. So we've identified a bunch of chemicals that make up the smell. Amazing. Great job. Thanks. But what we still don't know is why some people can smell smells while others smell nothing. Well, because some people have a word for it, right? So does that mean if you don't have a word for a smell, you can't smell it? Don't ask me. <sighs> ask him. OK, I will. Sorry, what? Have you heard of Zanka before? Uh, yeah, I have, I have, uh, and I've heard of it more in other languages that uh, I know about, so I'm a Southeast Asia expert. Uh, the language that I work on is Lao, spoken in Laos, and we have a word cow, which means something very similar. So if you don't have a word for something, does that mean you don't notice it at all? I think it's likely that you don't notice it, yeah. Having a word for something really focuses your attention and draws you to notice certain things and many other things you, you won't notice. So an example would be deja vu. I was looking for the word for deja vu in Lao, and I was told, well, we don't have a word for that, 
and I don't even know what you're talking about. What is this strange experience that you speak of? Uh, and so it seems pretty clear that indeed that they don't have the experience of deja vu in the same way that I think the average English speaker does because they're not repeatedly paying attention to it and sort of carving it out of the diffuse sorts of experiences they're having from moment to moment. So it's a bit like with a dog whistle, you blow this whistle, it makes a sound, and a dog can hear it, but a human being is not even aware that it's there. Or like how some people can hear me talking right now while you can't. <laughs> yeah, she makes a great point. <laughs> anyway, I had my answer, so it was time for me to leave these academic eggheads behind and get back to the studio. Yeah, probably should have let me do that one. So, if you can smell something on your plates, it's probably because the culture you were brought up in makes you more attuned to it. But if it was never part of your culture, even if the smell was in your home, it's probably not going to be something that you understand. Still, if you keep talking about it and thinking about it, it might become a part of your culture and then you might start to be able to smell it too. Oh my God, I can smell it. Oh no. I've ruined plates for myself. Oh, damn.